morning and thank you for joining us. First, some breaking news. A large explosion hit central Cairo about two hours ago, targeting the headquarters of Egyptian police in the city. Reports of a car bomb that caused the explosion are coming out now, as well as conflicting reports of fatalities. One to three confirmed dead at this point. Dozens of injured reported by eyewitnesses, as well as some gunfire, supposedly according to eyewitnesses, that broke out after the explosion. As we said, an explosion hits central Cairo, right next to the police headquarters in the city. Tomorrow marks three years to the ousting of President Hosni Mubarak, as well as the what they call the January 25th revolution. revolution. Cairo's on a high alert, fearing reprisals from Muslim Brotherhood supporters who are also planning banners and gathering after Friday prayers this afternoon. As we said, an explosion hits Cairo, central Cairo, several hours ago. We will give you more reports throughout the show. Now to more breaking news overnight. A ceasefire deal signed in South Sudan, signaling the first positive step towards peace negotiations in the embattled new democracy, where fighting between rebel forces and the government has been raging since mid-December. First joined on the phone by freelance journalist Andrew Green, who's in Juba, to hear more about it. Andrew, good morning to you. Good morning. Well, well first of all, give us the lowdown in terms of the overnight. Is this a positive sign? There are some reports from New York you know, saying that international powers are afraid that the um, uh, fighting will continue. But the ceasefire has been signed, correct? The ceasefire has been signed between forces that were loyal to former Vice President Riek Machar and the government. And the agreement also includes uh, humanitarian access to the half million people within the country who have been displaced. Uh, which is something that the United Nations and other groups were pushing for. However, there are serious concerns that Mashar does not actually have control over uh, large groups of the rebels who have turned against the government and are fighting. So we're yet to see whether uh, the fighting will actually stop, um, whether the, the groups, all the groups that are fighting will adhere to the ceasefire agreement or feel like they were even actually included in it. Right, always a problem in, in, in those situations. That said, you know, you're in Juba, and when, you know, what is being felt on the ground now that the ceasefire has been signed, be it Juba or, you know, throughout South Sudan, is there a feeling that things are calming down? Is there any representation of that on the ground? Yes, Juba uh, has been fairly calm. There's still heavy presence of soldiers, both uh, from Uganda and South Sudan. Um, but there's still, the fighting is still very close uh, to the capital. There are reports of fighting in Awirial, which is um, about 50, 70 kilometers away from the capital two days ago, um, and, and reports of flare-ups of fighting around the country, uh, especially the eastern half, over the past week. Um, so it will be, everyone's kind of holding their breath and waiting to see whether the ceasefire agreement means that the fighting will diminish or whether it will continue at the pace it has. Right. And finally, you know, the ceasefire is just the first step. Peace negotiations are supposed to start. Any idea, any scheduling to that? Uh, we've not heard what the, what the next steps are going to be. And uh, obviously, those are going to start turning to uh, discussing uh, peace agreement and what that's going to look like, how Mashar and other rebels will be reintegrated back into the the army, um, the president has issued an amnesty offer to the former vice president. So we're waiting to see whether Rashar will take him up on that or, um, or or how this is, whether he'll go into exile or what the, the future government is going to look like. All right. Andrew Green joining us from Juba. Thank you for being with us this morning. Now to our main topic of the morning. The German government is conditioning continued grants to Israeli high-tech companies as well as the renewal of a scientific cooperation agreement on the inclusion of a territorial clause stating that Israeli entities located in West Bank settlements or East Jerusalem will not be eligible for funding. Israel fears the German move will lead other European Union member states to follow. We're joined in studio and very happy for that by former Consul General in New York and former member of the Israeli Parliament Ambassador Coletta Vital. Good morning mm -hmm. to you. And before we delve into the subject, let's take a look at the following report. There's a lot at stake in the recent Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations. 
Whether they fail or not, Germany stepped in to make one thing clear regarding Israeli borders. The German government announced it is conditioning grants to Israeli high-tech companies, provided settlements will not benefit from its funding. This decision comes after Israel hoped that the settlements would not be debatable for a while after signing the Horizon 2020 scientific cooperation with the EU. Germany's stand could harm much of the Israeli high-tech sector. In Davos, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu came to hail Israel as an innovation nation. On Thursday, he was met with kind words about the Israeli economy. What is also remarkable is the resilience and ever-growing pace of Israel's high-tech sector, an area I know you care particularly much about, which is a key contributor to your country's unique position in the global economy. Compliments are not enough following the reports from Germany. The prospect of future investments in Israel was addressed by Netanyahu. He presented the issue as a means to establish long-lasting peace. The investment in the growth of the Israeli economy is good for our society and it's also good for our neighbors, whether they realize it or not. I believe that in the peace negotiations, advancing the economic peace alongside the political peace. One does not replace the other. Israel fears that more EU members will follow Germany's lead. The special relationship between Israel and Germany is a bit shaky now, as a friendly nation signals Israel that time is money and it's about to run out. Also joined from Jerusalem by German journalist Ulrich Zam. Ulrich, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Okay, first of all, this decision, and was this a shock coming about, or was this in the works for a while in Germany, the recommendation, so to speak? Well, for the time being, I'm hearing from German officials, and I see in the German uh, media, that this is an article in Haaretz, in the Israeli newspaper, while German officials do not deny or do not uh, say, well, everything is correct. And German officials talk about very, very good and intensive uh, relations with Israel. Merkel, the German chancellor, will come to Israel very soon. Steinmeier, the f foreign minister, made his first trip as foreign minister again, uh, made it to Israel. He, by coincidence, came when Sharon died. But this is to show that the relations are really good and uh, the politics against the settlements is, some, is a standing policy since the 70s. True, but that, you know, that would signal that it's not just a policy, but it's also something that's being put in effect. Do stay with us, Ulrich. Ambassador Coletta Vital, you know, whether the German media is confirming or it's not confirming nor denying the report in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, this is one, you know, one more element in the line of threats to boycott Israel due to settlement activity. But what makes this different if this is Germany? First of all, it's not new. If you recall, the European Union announced a few months ago right. that this will be the policy. And then there were negotiations to try to sort of mellow this whole decision down. I think what is new is the fact that Germany is coming out in a very, with very clear uh, signals uh, crystal clear, in fact, to the state of Israel. We know that in the past, uh, the Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, was quite upset and, and made it very clear about Israel's policy on the West Bank, the continued settlements, the, the fact that this was going to harm the peace process. But what is maybe new is the fact that notwithstanding the fact that so many Israelis thought that this was not about to happen, Germany not only is doing it, is going to lead the others. Germany is no doubt the strongest economic power in the European Union. Germany is considered to be our staunchest ally, our best friend in the European Union. If Germany does this, then other countries will not have any hesitation to follow through. Yeah, very interesting and important in that respect. Ulrich Sam still joining us some, uh, from Jerusalem. When it comes to the British press, uh, sorry, when it comes to the German press, my mistake, of course, as you said, there's no, uh, there's no confirmation or denial. But it have, it, can we say that throughout the, the last several years, not just the 70s, there is more push for boycott? I mean, there's, um, uh, there is a, um, uh, an organization, an email received by the Electronic Intifada, 
Omar Barghouti, who is behind the boycott, divestment and sanctions initiative to boycott Israel, calls the German decision or inclination an extremely significant development in the fast-spreading European boycott. So is there support within the German people? I mean, I'm not talking about the mainstream press, but within, you know, the mainstream agenda to go ahead and boycott certain relations with Israeli settlements or Israeli West Bank locations. Well, uh, as far as I understand and what I hear from German officials also, Germany is very much against a boycott of Israel. But as Coletta Vital just said, and that's very correct, uh, Germany makes a precedence if it leads. And there's another thing, another problem, a very major problem we are talking about is labeling uh, products from the settlements. And in this point, uh, there's a German diplomat, uh, Andreas Reinecke, who was a leading personality doing uh, promoting this also in Germany uh, but in the name of uh, the EU in Brussels so labeling products is already half a boycott and the Germans are kind of sensitive about that no no uh, definitely in Coletta um, ambassador of Vital you know there's also the um, uh, the British ambassador in Tel Aviv warned um, uh, Matthew Gold, he warned several weeks ago, I think uh, it was. The ambassador of the European Union. Exactly. Etc. I think that one has to realize that the patience of the Europeans is running short. For so many years they've done efforts. They, on the other hand, wanted to encourage Israel to give it a package of, of incentives should the peace process come to any kind of positive resolution. So I think one has to start understanding. We have cabinet ministers in this country who think that if there should be a Palestinian state, that will be a terrible, terrible danger to Israel. We I can call Mene, the to, economy minister in Israel, Naftali exactly, Bennett, was quoted as saying is, that at the yeah, beginning of the week. That's exactly what and whom I meant. On the other hand, I think it's Naftali Bennett who has to understand that the lack of a peace process, the lack of, of peace, actually, of, or an agreement, the continuation of the settlement policy on the West Bank while we are negotiating, there are this, there's building going on. This is going to be a danger to the economy of Israel. Well, a danger that now seems to be spiraling slightly out of control. I mean, Ulish, as you said, this is not a boycott that's happening right now. But it's something that, you know, still, it hit the press. Angela Merkel is due to arrive, I think, you know, next time, in the next several weeks for a visit in Israel. Any idea what is going to be discussed? Well, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things which are common for Germany and uh, Israel. You have youth exchange. You have a lot of academic uh, cooperation. You have uh, economics, etc. They have a lot of uh, subjects to talk about. And Israel has a lot, of, a lot to offer to uh, Germany. And that is why Germany actually is so interested in having good relations with Israel inside the lines of 67, inside the borders. No, which, and the, the fact, I think, that, you know, Germany is, that it's, you know, is also stating that it's within the lines, that it's part of this European trend of, you know, just greater Israel is not what Israel perceives to be greater Israel. And Ambassador Vital, because you've been in, in political life all your life, and I'm looking at Davos 2014 right now. And there's not much, I mean, the Israeli um, uh, government delegation went there. There's also a business delegation that went there trying to promote peace. But there's also, exactly. There's a business delegation of major businessmen and women who went there to tell the prime minister, you better make peace because we are going to lose and to lose great. In other words, prime minister presenting a picture, everything is wonderful, the Israeli economy is fabulous. It's in your interest and in our interest to come. It, the, the, the whole region will benefit by it. And there is a more sobering line of people who are in business who already feel the crunch, many of them. Right. Many of them already know that many of their businesses have been put aside or have been boycotted, and they are the ones there to say to the prime minister, there has to be a positive issue to those negotiations. And I mean, when, and when there was a delegation as such, we had, you know, Prime Minister Antonio also gave spoken Davos yesterday. As you said, he's, he's mentioned the great high-tech possibilities of the, um, of the country of Israel. Is there a disregard, though, by the government, you know, completely of what is going on? I mean, or is there just, is this just symbolism no, out of I, Europe? I think, I think there was a, a, a sort of a way to go around the real problem. Um, I'm sure that there were many consultations what line this prime minister should should 
show there, and he went there sort of to promote Israeli business, which is fine, which is wonderful. But Davos is also, a poli at the end of the day, it's also, a, not if not a political forum, a political meeting place. Rouhani wouldn't have come there. Um, leaders of the world wouldn't come there only in order to make business. Right, if it, if it didn't hold water, not just symbolically. And, and finally, I think the Prime Minister is bound to meet today, Secretary of State Kerry, and to discuss the peace process. Uh, they're going on other um, negotiations on Syria, uh, etc. While Davos is going on, this is happening in Geneva. So Man. we are seeing a world that is moving, and I think we should get in pace. Definitely. Very, um, very much so. Uh, Ambassador Avital, thank you so much for thank joining you. us um, you. whenever you're here. When we get back, India reels from yet another horrific gang rape case in a wave of sexual violence that is plaguing the country. First, though, let's hear some more of this morning headlines. And thank you for staying with us. I24 News Morning Edition, Friday, where we say hello and good morning to a one and only Anthony Grant, who joins us daily to discuss the news you might have missed while scanning the headlines and many headlines today. Yes, well, here's yes. a very interesting one that uh, just from this morning, Ynet uh, Online oh. says that um, a Lebanese TV station, LBC, has been allowed onto an Israeli Air Force base to send Hezbollah a message. Now, ah. this is. <laughs> I okay. don't know. This media may, corporation. It may be unprecedented. <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't checked that deeply into it, but on, just on the basis of the headline, it's quite telling. A Lebanese station allowed into an Israeli Air Force base for no, that's, a that's broadcast very on telling. Lebanese I mean, television. That's usually something, that's something that I never thought would pass by the IDF spokesman office. Right, um, right. Getting and, that and, and, actually, and they spoke with the spokesperson at this uh, Ramat David Air Base. And of course, um, that issue the warning dealing with the um, a warning against the transfer of strategic weapons from Syria to Hezbollah, which for the Israel is a, a major understatement right. issue. And if, if anything, that happens, it's, a, it's a very interesting use of um, uh, of uh, of the media in this whole you know chessboard that is the Middle East. But yeah. yes, fascinating. So we'll follow that yeah. one. Also, Israel Hayom, uh, interesting headline as well, on a different, more domestic Israeli note. A report says that the Israel's a uh, black economy tops uh, U.S. equivalent to $53 billion a year because 40,000 or one-third of Israel's private companies fail to duly pay their taxes. No. Really? Yeah. <laughs> this may not come as a huge shock <laughs> yeah. to those of us who are in Israel. So, and are but, paying their taxes. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. All of them, sadly. Yeah. Yes. So that's wow. interesting to note. And um, <sighs> I'm sure that the tax authorities will be all, jumping all over that I'm, story. One would only hope so because I think we should share the fun. You know, Absolutely. I'm just saying yeah. that, yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. right. that's also a major uh, domestic Israeli story. And yep. also Israel, uh, and Ynet also reporting that Shimon Peres, uh, Israel's president, blasted uh, a Ro uh, Iranian President Rouhani's Davos speech, saying that, you know, he was the only leader that, that didn't clearly say that the time has really come for Israel and the Arabs to make peace. And, and Peres really marked, uh, um, in his remarks was uh, struck by the omissions in Rouhani's speech. You no, know, no, and it's interesting to see, you know, we touch on Davos several times this week, but, you know, at the end of the day in Montreux in, in Davos, it's a stage to make statements as such. As, you know, one may wonder what really happens there, but it's those speeches that come on board and, you know, basically set the tone for political negotiations, a lack thereof. Yeah, and people yeah. can kind of take away what they want from those speeches. And in fact, in the next article I wanted to show from The Guardian, look at their headline. Uh, uh, Davos 2014, <clears throat> Iran ready to engage with the world, says Rouhani. And they take out, uh, they, they point up the fact that he said, come and visit Iran to see the investment opportunities. I mean, you can read <laughs> yeah. so many things depending on what you, you take out of these speeches. You don't need to read between the line of coming investment opportunities yeah. because this, um, you know, talking about the agreement signed with the, six, with the world powers mm -hmm. between Iran and the world powers, you know, what's at play is mostly the money. It's mostly the money, and he's setting the stage for that, and Davos is the stage for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah kind of a fitting backdrop for that. And I think that the, the Davos conference continues, actually, until Saturday, but most of the world yep. leaders have, have given their big statements they've given already. Their I think now it's just left to Matt Damon and Goldie Hawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt Damon on the water uh, issue. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that I'd attend, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Washington Post talks about these new blimps. Um, that are going blimps. to be, yeah, these new surveillance blimps that are... Are you serious? Are, <laughs> How very World War II. Yeah, well, uh, a little reminiscent of the Hindenburg. Actually, a couple of these will be hovering over the I-95 in Maryland, and it's setting off some <laughs> privacy worries. <laughs> 
I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, wow. the Army says that they're not going to put cameras up there, that it's actually sort of uh, for radar to ward off uh, any ICBMs that might it... be heading towards the United States. Um, Re really? Yeah. Okay. You know, this is another or great... Or to warn off Amazon drones. Uh, right. Yeah. Or maybe <laughs> to just uh, raise the bar so Amazon has something to, uh, to, to aspire really, yeah. to. Wow. Um, I think Raytheon is the uh, big defense contractor behind these uh, blimps. It's basically what they are. But they're actually tethered to the ground. Or they will be tethered to the ground starting in, a, I think, yeah. in October. But um, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, no, I think the see, U.S. Army likes to make things that hover and that hover and, and are above and expensive, and expensive hovering objects. So many things I could say about that that are not <laughs> PC for television. Yes. Yeah, talking about not PC. Corriere della Sera, my favorite Milanese newspaper. And, uh, you pronounce so well. Well, yes. you know, when you talk about Berlusconi, how can you not? Ah, yeah. You know, he's had a rough life, Berlusconi. Very so much so, very now, much so. <laughs> now he's taken to with his new girlfriend, Francesca Pascale. There. Is at, that him? No, that's the hotel. No, that's okay. an illustrative photo. Um, they are shacking up at the Villa Paradiso at 2,400 euros a day um, to relax while uh, he has been accused of bribing witnesses in that uh, sort of uh, the bunga bunga trial where you know, mm -hmm. the, the women, some of them apparently underage. So while that's going on, he's getting did some R&R &R at the Villa Paradiso. Did you just deem it the bunga bunga trial? Did you just come I up? did. That's that was unofficial. very good. Yeah. That's yeah, okay. Well, they were called bunga bunga parties. True, true. The bunga bunga parties, yeah. Yeah, so he's kind of... Uh, I mean, Bill Biscarni's life is like an extended Wolf of Wall Street scene in many ways, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, with, with, with Italian uh, subtitles built in. <laughs> built in completely. <laughs> I have to say, between him and no, he, he does keep it fascinating, very colorful. And, yeah. yeah, and at you know, 800 years old, he still keeps it going on so many levels. How old is the girlfriend? Do we know? Uh, the current one, I think, is above age. She's I above mean, age. She's, she's legal she's, age. She's of legal. Consent. Okay, yeah, that's good. Okay. Which is good. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, yes. Like pizza. Love pizza. So does the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> the Italian yeah. police. Yes. <laughs> have seized multiple pizza restaurants in Rome because apparently a lot of these were uh, part of a mafia ring and who knew that the mafia reach extended as far as your local neighborhood pizzeria in Rome I mean they, uh, the uh 90 suspected members pizza? of a Naples mafia yeah. ring were served with arrest warrants and pizza was at the center of these um allegations uh, in, in what way I'm just trying <laughs> to figure out that it's it's pizza that was that had it's just they own the pizza places. I think that's basically it. And, and maybe there could have been some money laundering some going money on laundering there, behind the pizza. Behind yeah. the pizza ovens. Actually, it's a serious stuff. One man jumped out of his window and killed himself when he was served with the, uh, 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 before the police came to arrest him on extortion charges. Wow. Yeah, so it's, uh, it no, 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 it's serious it, stuff. It, it definitely puts you on know, a completely different, it's a different take and double, you know, double cheese. The mafia. Yeah, yeah th there you continues. go. Wow. Uh, Tony, sadly, all the time we have okay. for this segment, but you'll join me the next hour. See you. On to more of the breaking news this morning. In Cairo, a car bomb exploded in the middle of the city, basically um, uh, right next to the police headquarters. We're currently hearing confirmed reports of at least five dead and dozens wounded. Once again, this uh, today is a day before Egypt marks three years to the January 25th revolution that ousted Hosni Mubarak. Since then, that revolution has just been spiraling ahead. And this comes parallel also to a new Amnesty International report claiming that Egypt has seen state violence on an unprecedented scale since the army overthrew Islamist President Mohamed Morsi last July following mass pro protests against his rule. But once again this morning, car bomb exploding in Cairo. We're seeing pictures from the scene. And we are um, uh, also joined in studio by I-24 News senior Middle East correspondent Ali Walker, Ali, thank you for joining Good us. Good morning. And before we break this down, let's look at the report of the last three years in Cairo, in Egypt. Five Egyptians killed by mass gunmen and overnight demonstrations in the capital by opponents of the military-backed regime. The events of the past 24 hours might be viewed as a microcosm of Egypt's turbulent state as the country prepares to mark the third anniversary of the overthrow of former strongman Hosni Mubarak. On January 25, 2011, Egyptians took to the streets to demand an end to Mubarak's three-decade rule. With the support of the international community, in particular from U.S. President Barack Obama, the masses realized their goal. Mubarak's reign was over. The power vacuum was swiftly filled by the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Its newly formed political wing won a landslide 2011-2012 parliamentary vote. Six months later, Brotherhood candidate Mohamed Morsi became Egypt's new president. Today, I'm the president of all the Egyptians wherever they are. Together we continue this journey. We come in peace. But Morsi was soon accused of attempting to impose Islamic Sharia law on the country. He would ultimately issue a decree granting himself dictatorial powers, a move which instead led to his demise. Egyptians had had enough, and like two and a half years before, they once again gathered by the hundreds of thousands in Tahrir Square in protest. Less than two weeks later, on July 3, 2013, the Egyptian army ousted Morsi from office. As of today, we are temporarily suspending the constitution, and the head of the Supreme Constitutional Court will manage the affairs of the country during the transitional period until the election of a new president. The crackdown, though, had barely begun. In clashes that followed, more than 1,000 pro-Morsi protesters were killed by security forces. Thousands more were arrested and put on trial, including Morsi and other Brotherhood leaders. Fast forward to today, and Egypt is marred by near-daily bombings and killings. The state has declared itself in a war on terror and on December 25th officially banned the Brotherhood. Amidst the turmoil, the interim government is nevertheless pressing ahead with its political roadmap, and just last week passed a new constitution with an overwhelming 98 percent yes vote. But critics abound. On Thursday, Amnesty International released a scathing report saying Egyptian authorities had inflicted a series of damaging blows to human rights and had perpetrated state violence on an unprecedented scale. The government was accused of trying to squeeze out any independent observers. Three years on then, the outcome of Egypt's revolution is far from decided. The country is mired in a state of limbo that may or may not soon be stabilized. Joined by Ali Wakit, senior Middle East correspondent for I-24 News. We're, well, first of all, this morning, um, a Cairo explosion right next to the police headquarters tomorrow's three years to the 25th of January revolution. I'm speaking in theory, and we are speaking in theory only. You know, people are already theorizing that this might be the Muslim Brotherhood behind that. We're seeing, you know, Egypt in major mayhem, and the Muslim Brotherhood, as much as the army and the authorities are trying to quell them, they're not going away, are they? Well, answering directly your question, I talked uh, this morning with uh, several of my uh, colleagues in, in Cairo, and one of them uh, um, answered to this question exactly, saying that the uh, car bombing that took place in a church at uh, the eve of the uh, January Revolution of 2011, after the police investigation, it appears that the Minister of Interior at that period, Habib al-Adli, was behind uh, this car uh, bombing in order to uh, convince the Egyptians that they should uh, continue the uh, emergency uh, situation and to, to ban other uh, political uh, rival organizations. I'm not saying that this is, uh, of course, uh, the case. The, now. Yeah. the case now. But I'm saying that the Egyptians are very divided. I heard this morning very uh, different uh, um, opinions about who can uh, be behind uh, this attack. But there was a unanimity among those um, different opinions that we're not yet at the peak of this wave of violence that will continue. We are tomorrow. It's the 25th. And since we were talking in the last month about uh, Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, we forgot Egypt and Egypt since a third, Jan, June 30, the uh, violence didn't stop. The demonstrations, the rallies, the killings, thousands of people who uh, lost uh, their lives. And I think the moment that uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi declares that he is a candidate for the presidency, I think even the moderate element in the uh, Muslim Brotherhood will will not be able to stop the radical uh, uh, the radical voices in the uh, organization to uh, not bring the Muslim Brotherhood directly involved in the. Uh, violence. For the moment, the intelligence uh, sources that I talked this morning think that this is uh, some radical Islamic uh, movement having relations with the Muslim okay, Brotherhood, Muslim. but not directly part of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, it is um, 
easy for the Egyptian regime to accuse directly the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, but there are many players right now, many uh, violent and terror groups acting in uh, in Egypt, trying uh, to uh, um, uh, use this uh, very uh, uh, complex situation right now. No, very complex, and as you mentioned, very rightfully so. Sisi, Al Sisi, who is you know basically heads the army right now, and the army is in control. We can call it what we want, but it's the army that's in control in Egypt, isn't it? Of course it is yeah. the army, and the target of this morning attack was a headquarter of the intelligence, a headquarter of the police, and it was not only a car bomb. According uh, to witnesses in the Arabic media and to a journalist that I talked today, there were all, also fire shooting uh, towards the building, means that the, the, uh, those who uh, stand behind this attack dared uh, to get from the car and to start shooting in the middle of Cairo and sending a clear message, we are here, this wave will not end in the coming in the next future and we're not going and we're not going away as you mentioned the um, uh, the fire the um, uh, the shootings that eyewitnesses were saying that they were that they were hearing after the explosion shows that this was planned this was mastermind and these are very very specific dates but as we're talking about you know this type of an attack the violence is not ending tomorrow is the 25th do you think that you know after three years of what we're seeing these shifting revolutions can the army maintain its power in Egypt the army can maintain uh, its power in Egypt, but it won't be without more and more uh, uh, protest and context. The opposition to the uh, army is very encouraged by the fact that the uh, percentage of the people who participated in the last referendum was uh, significantly under all the expectations of the regime. We are talking about 38 uh, percent. According to them, this is a sign of the people that we want the continuation of this mass uh, protest, and we want uh, this mass protest to escalate and to uh, maintain. And to maintain. Ali Wakid, thank you so much for joining us this morning. When we get back, more devastating news from India about another sex crime. First, though, let's hear some more of this morning headlines. Thank you for joining us, I-24 News Morning Edition. Now, a 20-year-old woman has been raped in public by as many as 12 men on the orders of tribal elders in a village in eastern India. The attack in the Birmingham district, about 120 miles from Calcutta, was a punishment for an unauthorized relationship with a man from another village and the woman's subsequent failure to pay a 490 pounds fine. To hear more about it and this devastating recurring sexual crimes in India, we are joined in studio by Channel 2 News Foreign Affairs Correspondent Safi Khaskeli. Asaf, thank you for joining me this morning. Before we delve into this, let's take a look at the following report. Is rape part of the Indian tribal legal system now? According to local police, village elders in eastern India ordered a punishment of gang rape on a woman in her early 20s who had a relationship with a man from a different community. I was raped by men from around the area. They were about 12 in number and belonged to the same age group. The woman was ordered to be raped by Salishi Sabha, a self-styled kangaroo court that dispenses justice in a village near Surrey in West Bengal state, 150 miles from Kolkata. The victim was in critical condition when she arrived for examination in hospital, as the police arrested 13 accused men for involvement in the dreadful act, 10 of whom made up the kangaroo court. Violence and discrimination against women remain deeply entrenched in India's patriarchal society as the government tries to tighten laws on sexual violence since the 2012 gang rape and murder of a student on a Delhi bus. No one has the right to order a woman's rape. This is unlawful and those responsible for the crime would be punished. The victim should be given justice. This is a horrific incident. In wake of this and several other incidents, our commission will hold discussions with the chief minister of West Bengal. According to government officials, crimes against women in the country rose by 6.4% in 2012. Over the last year, gang rapes provoked a national wave of protests and international attention, but the sexual violence continues. Only last week, a Danish tourist was gang raped in New Delhi, casting the country's record on sexual violence back into the spotlight. 
First joined on the phone by Anjali Gopalan, Executive Director of NAS Foundation India Trust in New Delhi, India. Um, Anjali, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. Now, the, the reactions to this horrific incident that seems to be almost, you know, you know, that it has been, so it seems, ordered by a village elder, by a council. What are the reactions in India? I mean, obviously, all of us who are in our right minds are horrified by this and do not condone it in any manner. We think it is not only is it illegal, it is immoral. I mean, on the one hand, you have this country, people constantly spouting about what a moral country we are and what a moral culture we are. And look what we're doing to our women. It's horrifying. I can't, we, we can't find words to express what we're feeling right now. Are there, I mean, rea reactions in the street? We've seen several demonstrations, but are authorities saying they're going to try and do something against it? Because clearly this seems to be a wave of sexual violence that's now embedded yeah. in, you know, local authorities. Right. Uh, the thing is that the authorities, you see that we have plenty of laws. Our problem is implementation. Uh, even if the authorities uh, followed the laws that they're supposed to follow, I think this young woman would get some kind of justice. But um, everything takes so long in this country. It's unbelievable how they just sit around not taking action, right? Because somewhere or the other, these men are connected politically. I also think there's an underlying political factor to most of this. Meaning what? It, uh, it's caste, it's politics, it's religion. All of it plays uh, uh, into it. You know, it's not, I don't think it's a simple, straightforward uh, thing that is happening. For example, the kangaroo courts themselves. Why can't our politicians take a stand against something that is so archaic? Yeah, very... None of them open their mouths. Very, very true and very, very valid point. And Jolly, thank you so much for joining us this morning on this devastating story. Now, Safi Khaskeli, Channel 2, um, uh, Israeli Channel 2 Foreign Affairs uh, correspondent. Let's start with that. Why did the Indian courts, why did sorry, the Indian politicians take a stand on something like that? You know, on one hand, India is a place where everybody outsources their work to. It's very modern in many respects in that way. But, you know, when it comes internally, we're, you know, we're seeing a wave of horrific pagan violence. Uh, I, I think we should uh, separate the two very different patterns of sexual violence in India. On the one hand, we have in the big cities the people who are unemployed, the younger people, the people who are uh, abused by alcohol, and uh, they do these crimes for uh, simple um, exploitation. Right. And on the rural part, which is what we heard now uh, from the almost border of Bangladesh, a very remote village. It's the tribal customs, it's the older people, and it's usually in the terms of revenge. Now, the laws that um, uh, forbid these kind of crimes are uh, implemented in some way, in some extent, in the big cities, in the rural areas. Uh, it is only for people who are now uh, 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 beginning to, to, to sense the feeling of central government to learn of these laws. Um, the uh, penetration of uh, satellite TV in India, the flourishing of a lot of uh, satellite TV channels, means that only in recent years do these villagers see in the single uh, television set they have in, in, in their village, they see what happens in the big cities. They, they understand that there is kind of, some kind of laws, and they learn that they can complain about it and make a lot of fuss about it. So this is a beginning of a very slow process, which might take many more years. Yes. No worries, but in the meantime, sadly, as we're seeing, and I don't, because this is not, you know, we can't call it really a completely backward society, that it's usually the minorities, the women, that do suffer. But we have been seeing over the course of the last, I'd say, year, a rise in sexual violence. It does feel like there is a, a wave of sexual violence, be it in the cities, now in the rural areas, I against think, women. I think it's a rise in reporting sexual crimes, okay. rather a rise than a rise in, in, in the crime rate. It, itself. It says that uh, India uh, sees a rate of rape every 21 minutes, which means something like 25,000 reported cases per year only, and this is only the number of the reported cases. Uh, um, it's, it's important that uh, they have now in recent years very um, strong female journalists very strong female ministers, and they had until uh, recent times a, a female president that, that uh, uh, although ceremony, in a ceremonial role, every uh, uh, one of these uh, female um, uh, figures 
are are doing a lot of uh, a lot of demonstrations. They had protests. They talk uh, like we've seen on on TV, and they try to make a very um, slow um, pro progress. Well, as you said, it will take way. time because it's implementation. And what what about education? I mean, is this beginning to be embedded in the education system in India? The idea of you know women's rights. The idea was that way too far, you know, into the future. I, I heard that there is a mandatory class of um, uh, sexual education and uh, uh, discomfort for women education and, and so on. And it is mandatory for uh, 11th grade uh, Indians. The problem is that so many Indians d do not get to 11th get educated yeah. in the 11th grade. No, yeah, very much so. And uh, Asafi Khaskali, thank you for joining us on this very disturbing phenomenon. But as you said, thank valid you. point that's just being reported more doesn't mean that, you know, it, it's a change. It's, it's been consistent there. Thank you for joining us this thank morning. You. Once again, in the words of Monty Python, now to something entire, completely different, entirely different. Uh, somewhat different. Somewhat, well, okay. Yeah, different. Yes. But uh, the Pope. Of course. No, we're talking about our web segment. And Pope Francis, the Pope, the Pope has said the, the internet is a gift from God. Oh my God! Not only that. No, I, I just he validated the the internet. He validated just, the web. This is the web segment, by the way. I always fail to mention this yeah, at the I mean, beginning the, of the how segment. How fitting, though. I mean, the yeah, Pope. Yeah, the Pope this, calls the internet a gift from God. Not only that. Listen to this. He said. He said the internet is like a balm which relieves pain, and a fine wine which gladdens hearts. I could use that bomb right now to decongest it. <laughs> Come on, Pope Francis. But you are sounding but, very sexy. Uh, <laughs> wow. That is, first of all, it's almost, I, I think, I'm sure big companies like Google and Yahoo are thanking They'll him. be all over this. They're all, they're, they yeah. all just turned Catholic. But <laughs> they, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. He also it, said, And though, it's interesting because usually it is the big establishment of old, um, uh, you know, of old religion that come out against modernity that come out against, mm. you know, the internet that is is a gift but also has a lot of dark places. Yeah, he tempered his <laughs> remarks by saying that the desire for digital connectivity can have the effect of isolating us from our neighbors and those closest to us. So. In other words, the web is great, Facebook is not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just you said it. I said it. Yes. And. Okay, I'm uh, moving on. Um, yesterday was International Museum Selfie Day. I'm sorry, I have to ask the other guest in this, the what? Museum selfie day. <laughs> People were supposed to go around museums and, you know, imitate the famous uh, work of art. But of course it is French, la selfie entrant en musée. Voilà, yeah. musée, voilà. La musée, okay. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's a Norman Rockwell picture, I'm loving this. Yeah, that, okay. uh, whichever that one is, I think yeah. that's American Gothic. Uh, it is. But uh, it is. you can just Google um, uh, Museum Selfie Day and you'll see galleries and different websites of this all the crazy the first, pictures. This is the first in, uh, Museum Selfie Day? I think so. I, I mean, think Selfie just entered into the just dictionary in this, this past summer. So. Last year. This yeah, year, so. I'm, I'm, sh I'm actually terrified to think what other selfie days will come up. <laughs> you know, public laboratories, selfie yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah well, no, maybe not. Well, let's hope not. Call Anthony Weiner, get your information on that it's one. Coming, he's coming yeah. up, isn't he? If Huma will let you talk to him. Huh. Still, yes. <laughs> let's Anthony talk about Wiener. Justin Bieber. Oh, no, we weren't going to Weiner. Justin Bieber, right up there, same kind of level. Yes, He's Bieber. gone off the deep end. He has, hasn't he? Yeah, he's been busted for drag racing while drunk and stoned. Drag racing? In Miami Beach. Uh, you know, Sorry. this is, I don't have the, what? <laughs> no, yeah, come on, what? Uh, it's, it's the oh, car. Oh, the so. car, it's a rented, a it's rented a yellow Lamborghini. You know, I can just see Rob Ford, you know, Justin Bieber is, is Canadian, <laughs> Rob Ford, and uh, trying to sing, hey, attaboy. Yeah, you know, That's the yeah. way to do it. Unbelievable. <laughs> he had told cops he'd been on antidepressants and smoking pot all day, apparently. This is not a good thing to be doing. He actually and, told cops he's been on antidepressants and smoking pot all that's day. Police, that's what police sources, well, police sources told the Miami Herald that, so I'm not sure if Bieber admitted to that, but maybe he did. Yeah. I did see, you know, and it was a slightly too, I did see a mug shot from uh, overnight of Justin Bieber. And he's and like, Exactly. <laughs> Apparently, he had a nervous breakdown after in tears. Really? Yeah, that's the latest info. So it's the smile, and then he had the nervous breakdown. It's all those antidepressants. Yeah. I'm not looking right at the situation. No, I mean, I think he has some issues. You know. Yeah, uh, maybe. You know, and, uh, other his... than just being Canadian. But you know what the the you know the conclusion of this is? Shouldn't go to Florida. Should not go to Florida. No, no. I mean, um, he had just left his home in Calabasas, where authorities were investigating him for throwing eggs allegedly at his neighbor's wall. So I think to get out of the he jumped he went from the, the heat to out of the out of the whatever and into laughing. the fire. Into the but, <laughs> but 
throwing eggs at his neighbors. Yeah, yeah. and apparently it was just, you know, he actually had one of, they, they cordoned off a street in Miami Beach to, to do this drag racing, mm -hmm. like other cars couldn't use the road. So he's got multiple legal issues to fight here. Coming up. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, to think that Fabulous. I was hoping he'd focus on his music a little bit more. Yeah, because, you know, I that, wasn't actually. That last, <laughs> that last hit of his. Yeah, what was that what even? Was it? What was it and when what was, was it? it? When? Yeah, I don't know. he's now just doing the Britney thing. Yes, <sighs> and thank How'd you. How do you like to, uh, to ride in a tank with Arnold Schwarzenegger? That's been a lifelong dream of mine. <laughs> <laughs> ride in a tank and work out with, with Arnold. I was yeah, like, almost winning it with the Arnold. Arnold, Arnold or, uh, he owns a tank. Who knew? Oh, no. Now, this is a website called omaze.com where people, you donate like $10, whatever, you raise, money is raised, and, and, and the lucky winner gets to have like uh, a night on the town of George Clooney, or you get to ride the tank with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the Arnold one is, um, it's for an after, this, after school kids project that it goes to fund. That's very and, educational. Yeah, although yeah. you get to smoke cigars with Arnold too. I'm not sure if that sends a great message no, to no, school no. kids. No, no, no. Yes, the but, school kids, or, or that, you know, the outcome of raising money for the school kids is riding in a tank <laughs> yeah. with Arnold. In California, yeah. I guess. I mean, yeah. You could, would, you, would you rather a riding a tank or a little Lambo Lamborghini? <laughs> uh, but actually, choice. that would be, that's a great startup, is, you know, come raise money and then you can get drunk on and, and have antidepressants with Justin Bieber and ride a Lamborghini. Mm. Yeah, America, the greatest country of all. I, I, yes. I frankly would rather be on a film set with Mick Jagger. Ah, yes. In Natchez, Mississippi, which because is where Mick Jagger currently is. Shooting a Did film? Did you know that? He is, uh, no. he is producing a film called Get On Up about James Brown. And uh, yeah, nice. it's fascinating stuff. He's, he's come out and said that he's, uh, he, he nixes the idea of ever doing a memoir, and he says, if you, if you think I should do a memoir like Keith Richards did, you know, just look up what I did in 1965 on Wikipedia. <laughs> Because Mick is busy <laughs> making a movie. He's, he's busy making a movie, but I have to say, I read Keith Richards. Um, uh, I know, you read that. It was it, fabulous. Was it coherent? Uh, not really. <laughs> I think the part of him actually, sn um, uh, he was snorting the ashes of his father at a certain point. Mm. Yeah, that was that was one of it's the... Organically sourced. Organically uh, sourced, and you know, it's a loving way to say goodbye to a relative. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting. Mick Jagger, though, I have to say, that would be one hell of a memoir. Yeah. yeah. And? Uh, fur. Fur. Never wonder in Israel when you sometimes see a shop that sells fur, like who needs a fur coat in the Middle East? I agree. And, yeah. and, and I, sadly, I have to admit, I come from, you know, a German relatives, Jewish German relatives, yeah. and they brought in a lot of fur back in the day. Wrong, yeah, well, wrong. In Germany, I could see yeah. it. It's cold yeah. out. But Pamela Anderson, who recently uh, was in Israel on a honeymoon, has written a letter oh, to Lord. Benjamin Netanyahu saying she wants Israel to be uh, the first country to, uh, to ban the sale of fur. And she says that the way uh, animals are suffering, it violates uh, Jewish principles. And um, She should know because she converted, didn't she? I don't know, but she did remarry her ex-husband, Rick Solomon, the star of that documentary, One Night in Paris. Okay. <laughs> That's not the one, the first husband from the sex video on the yacht for That's many years ago. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. That is who you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but she's all there for animal advocacy, and we love that about our former Baywatch star. Okay. Um, lovely. Um, Tony, thank you for that stuff. When we get back, something completely different again. Honeybees have been dying in huge numbers since 2006. A new study seems to have the answer as to why. First, though, let's go back to the morning headlines. And thank you for staying with us, I-24 News Morning Edition on this Friday. Very, very exciting day. We are joined by journalist Neta Khitov bringing us the environmental news. Yes. Um, yes, that you missed while snoozing, something to that effect, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you have lots of, I'm going to sound really shallow, animal news yes, for us. Yes, today we have many animals. <laughs> Shoot. But we start with no animal okay. item. Okay, we'll build it up. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, this week the European Commission has decided to um, declare an integrated climate and energy policy, which is very good. Meaning what? And they are changing the 2020 you know, goals into 2030 goals 
years, in mm-hmm. years, yeah, right, 2030, yes, uh, they are going to reduce 40% of gas emissions until 2030, and renewable energy will count for 27% of energy in the EU. Yeah. Okay. It sounds very good. It sounds good. You know, but environmentalists, theory. you know, they're never happy. They're very frustrated people. <laughs> so we have you guys for This yes. is. <laughs> we're not happy about it. This is not enough. We thought it would be more. And, and why 2030? Why yes, not next exactly year? Exactly what's yeah. going on here. And to the environmentalists, Germany also joined because uh, Germany, you know, they closed all their nuclear power plants. True. And they wanted the renewables energy to be 30% as in Germany. And they said, it's not fair that we are doing such an effort. And then all and the rest, the rest of, of them are. Yeah. Yes. And but another, the Germans have a system. Okay. Yeah, they're very yeah, They're systematic. very organized. That's yes. not a good phrase to say. The Germans <laughs> have a system, not Come in on. Israel. Yeah. If, <laughs> and they the have a green, a green yes. system. <laughs> they're very environmental, the Germans. Mm, yes. yes. OK, let's. <laughs> wow, God, that opened yeah. the door for so many things. Let's not go yes. there. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, they also. Um, set for the first time uh, recommendations for shale gas, uh, you know, for fracking, which is a very good thing. Uh, They're not binding the recommendations, but they are, you know, they're good that they're there. And the countries, they they can, if they want, sign the, you know, this We're not going to force recommendations. it, yeah. yeah. It means they have to do a really deep and thorough assessment of the environmental risks and you know effects. They have to uh, let the public know about the chemicals used in the fracking and many other recommendations at this well, well, year. Well, maybe it's, I'm trying to be optimistic as yeah. opposed to, you know, every other day, that maybe this leads towards, you know, yeah. some some form of change, uh, even yeah. if it's... I think the, the, the main issue is not the details. It's the fact that yeah, people that, become aware of it, yeah, people exactly. are taking Taking action, right. yeah. whether it takes 20, 20, 20, 30, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. People have become more aware. That's true. Yeah. And, but still. the states are not happy because they are saying that they, it, you know, turn it, the competitiveness skills ah, of, of course. them, yeah, of course. are uh, reduced. That's in the this states, way. isn't it? Yeah. The gas, yeah. for example, in the U.S. is third the price than in uh, Europe because of all this, uh, you because know, taxes and yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, there's capitalism for you. Yeah, but we are in, yeah. We're in the fight. Yes. yes. And the bees, the honeybees. The honey bees, bees. The I've honey heard bees. you've been talking about it before. No, because I actually remembered, oddly enough, that you told us several months ago that yes. they're dying in stroves. Yes, they're okay. dying in stroves. There's the colony collapse disorder. And since 2006, a third of the birds' colonies. It's called the colony collapse disorder? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, what do you know? Colony collapse the source of the CCD. It's the CCD. Yeah. Wow. So third of the uh, of the bees uh, are dying are died since 2006. This is a lot. Uh, people didn't know for many many Bears years. Around yeah, the world what's going on? The main uh, theory today, the leading theory, is because of pesticides. But there it's is a us new to blame. Yes, yes. There is a new research that says that it's because of a virus that comes from the tobacco flowers. Yeah, that they, the honeybees basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They are, they, yeah. It's a virus. Uh, it's in the pollen of the tobacco flowers, and then it goes through a mutation, and it affects the bees, and they're dying because wow. of that. Yeah, this is the new research of this. I'm know, not making light of this. Of it this sounds week. like you know, it sounds like yeah. the honeybees HIV. Yeah, in many it's ways. very bad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> any, so, any ideas of how to solve that? Uh, no, they're no, trying now because it's no, a mutation it's, of the virus. They know how to solve the tobacco virus, but this is a mutation of it. And they're, yeah, they're, it's yeah. just a new research. And I guess they. Like it sounds like a very depressing Disney yeah. movie. The next step will be yes. how to solve it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's depressing. Okay. And <laughs> some <laughs> optimism. Some optimism, please, yes, shall yes. we? <laughs> yeah. Turtles in the Great Barrier Reef in oh. Australia. Yeah. Uh, it, you have to see that this is beautiful. This is a female turtle. When she's 30, she comes, you know, from the ocean and she nests there for a couple of months. And then oh. there are these eggs, 130 Creation. eggs per uh, female, and then they hatch, um, usually between January are we and March. Live birth right now. Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Amazing, huh? Yes. She's it's... really, really exhausted after Where's it. Where's the this... gynecologist now? I know. It's such a reality show on Israeli yeah. television. But... Uh, I hope soon we'll see the little ones. They're so sweet. Yes. And then they hatch between uh, January and March, and they know exactly the way to the ocean. They just come out of the egg and walk kidding, really no fast. Way. Yes, to the ocean. And this is uh, thanks to four decades of, pres- you know, reservation, preservation, yeah, yeah, and conservation. And uh, wow, the Australians are really into their turtles. <laughs> they really love they them. They're helping, and this, they're helping the turtle yeah. eggs hatch? Yeah, no. they're putting them to incubate for uh, eight weeks. 
Yeah, because uh, if it's ah, too shallow, the birds. Okay, the birds what they are doing here? Yeah, because of the last year there was the cyclone and really bad floodings. Yeah, so they help. They're helping them. Ah, oh, you see them. They're oh, helping them uh, because of weather. Yes. Say so they hatch alone. Where's mommy? Uh, she's not there. She's, she's bound gone. To see, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. That's a kind of parents' so, problem. Um, that's my yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this year was really good. After last year was really really bad. They lost sixty. percent of the eggs last year because of the bad Look weather that, yeah. and this year they are really amazing there are hundreds of I'm new turtles I'm this you know animal in nature basically hatching on its own and then fighting its way to sea yes how do we educate babies to do that yeah they have this they, they have their they respond to light their inner, and to yeah. uh, the moon to, to, to the, the light so if you shine up on them yeah. they, they turn go, around they turn and turn around. towards yeah. the light and they have a, this magnetic uh, GPS kind of and they know where the moon is and they yeah. go according to that and this is a tourist attraction attraction there are 30,000 people right now there coming for hatching yes. for it was yeah. January to, through March yes wow uh, to watch them uh, but they don't harm them you know they no, it, it's, it's very it's strict there you have you stand in one point and no beautiful yeah, this we is need really some more of that in the Middle East yes. yes and a really sad story Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm warning you. Yeah, I'm warning you. Me, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dolphins. Oh, God, uh, no. Yeah, they're being, Japan? Yeah, they're being oh. slaughtered in Japan. But it, uh, it uh, yeah, here you can see them. It uh, made a diplomacy incident when um, uh, Caroline Kennedy, she's the daughter of JFK. She's I know, the she's new, the ambassador yeah, of Yeah, she's um, the ambassador of, of US, the US in Japan. She just uh, been nominated in November, so she's really fresh. And she tweeted yesterday, Concerned by inhumanness of drive hunt dolphins killing, That USG, which means U.S. government, yeah. opposes drive hunt fisheries. And then all the Japanese oh, came yeah. on to her and, what are you talking about? This is a traditional thing. It's not, you know, not killing worse than killing tradition. cows or yeah. chickens or pigs in the U.S. And we do it in a very human way. And dolphins are not, um, you know, they are not... Um, How oh, do you God. call it? Uh, protected. They're not protected. Yeah, animals, Maybe it's like time to whales. protect them. Yeah. Okay. Neta, sadly, uh, that's all the time we have to set on this like dolphin depressing note. But stay with us I'm as safe. we're joined in studio by the director of the um, Econogetics Unit at Shiva Medical Center, Professor Ethan Friedman. Professor Friedman, good morning to you. Good morning. And you're here with the latest leading medical researcher. Surprise me and please don't depress me. No. Yes. <laughs> Watching a lot of TV for kids is not good. We've known that for a long time. Stop. <laughs> Even though no. we're cutting the... <gasps> really? Yeah, okay. It's, it's not good for you. But there, there's been a lot of research that focuses around uh, psychology and phenotype. This is the first research where they've actually documented changes... We've by, finally proven it. It's not just the dumb look that the kid exactly. gets in it's his eyes. It's anatomical changes in the brain of individuals, and it correlates. There's more of, of gray matter rather than white matter in the brains of individuals, and it correlates with the amount of TV being watched, and that is at that at a single point in time and over a period of time, and that's specifically for children. Now, that increased area of gray matter in the brain is correlated with poor uh, vocabulary skills in, in individuals based on other research. communication. I, exactly. Yeah. Now, it, it does not prove causality. Namely, it's not actually watching TV. It may be the fact that they're doing it by themselves. They're not interacting with other people. They're not physically active. They're not Just reading. Just because they're alone? Exactly. It's because, maybe it's because they're alone. There is no... It's, it, it doesn't prove that watching TV per se is deleterious, but it mean, but it, <laughs> it, it actually means that you need to communicate, you need to read, you need to be out there. You cannot, and my recommendation is that you, as parents, you limit the time that the kids no, watch TV. No, I was about TV. to say, because you cannot, in this day and age, no, and I have to say this is a new part, you cannot, you cannot prevent screens. No, 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 I don't, I don't you know, intend, do I'm, yeah, I, exactly constantly. you have, you have right. to be up with the time, but you cannot let your kid, like, sit in front of the TV on holidays. for like 12 hours, 12 a, day. hours a day that's not that's not going to happen if you're tired and exhausted yeah, exactly send them to, to play in the yes. playground and yeah. et cetera. Just get them out into the yeah, sand yeah, exactly so this is, But is is this study leading to some point of sorry fascinated here as, as a mother to some point of you know there should be an x amount of hours throughout the day if you limit it to what to one to two i i think i think the rule of thumb is that you limit it to between an hour and two hours maximum maximum, maximum a day right. and that has it's the last priority the first priority is to 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 read to do your homework to interact with other people yeah, be good it luck a, on about, that one. Uh, you know yeah <laughs> but still that, okay no, no, but, but limiting you know it's, exactly it's, it's but it's the obvious. first study that yeah. actually showed that there are anatomical changes associated with watching a lot with of watching TV. that but it's for, it's interesting in that respect and quickly moving on yes moving moving right along um, there's for 
right now, when we say uh, there is inherited predisposition to cancer, we usually say that between 5 to 10 percent of all incident breast cancer cases have inherited mutations. Mm -hmm, yeah, right. Well, for ovarian cancer, Genetic, you mean from a family, so, yeah. so individuals with a lot of family history of cancer, it's, it's a minority of all cancer patients. Right. Roughly between 5 to 10 percent of all cancer patients with ovarian cancer. In Israel, there is a, a unique uh, reality, namely 35 percent of all individuals with ovarian cancer have an inherited mutation. Now, we, that is specific for Israelis, for Jewish individuals. Really? Right, yes. Right okay. now, in, from, in, in a study out of Canada, it turns out that at least 20% of individuals with ovarian cancer, regardless of age of onset, regardless of family history, do harbor mutations in cancer susceptibility genes. Now, to me, this is great news because, A, that's what Why? I do every day. Okay. You can identify objectively and genetically individuals who are at high risk for developing ovarian cancer by ad starting treatment, early detection, re risk removing surgery. It's it's a b major major breakthrough because we, if we save one three women from having ovarian cancer, that money saved. I'm not talking about lives. No, I'm not no, talking no, about no. The suffering. I'm talking about the money that we save would enable us to screen every single individual in Israel who has who had breast cancer and ovarian cancer and colon cancer. Three women that we saved. To me, this is excellent. It's, it's not excellent news for the women, but it provides us with an additional tool to identify high-risk individuals and target and them for It's all a process early, of research uh, in that respect. For women, I'll take one. You know, and yeah. uh, it, it, In that respect, it doesn't matter. And what else? There is new, uh, a new genetic treatment for Parkinson's disease. You know, Parkinson's what? Yeah, genetic treatment for Parkinson's disease. You heard me. <laughs> no, I've, I've got, we've got to, I've, well, I, yeah, we have relatives with Parkinson's in the family, meaning that... Yeah. Parkinson's disease is a very, very common disorder, and up to 4% of individuals over the age of 80 have Parkinson's disease. We cannot, you know, most individuals do respond to initial therapy, but at least 60% after a few years, right, that, stops, that, that stops, stops working. Completely. In this study, actually injecting a vector that contains three genes into the brain of Parkinson's disease patients is safe and it helps reduce the, the symptoms and it provides them with an ability to function in the society. Now, this no, which is, is exciting, which is exciting, 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 it's, exciting, it, it exciting it is, beyond belief. I is, agree. And last but not least. Last but not least. Uh, what do we want to talk yes. about? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Bleep. Sleep something. Oh, yes. yeah. Jet lag. We know that jet lag and shift work is not is deleterious to your health. Mm -hmm. Now we oh, talk, yes. it is deleterious yes, to I your know. health, mm -hmm. and it actually has been nominated. It's been marked by the IARC as po possible carcinogenic. It's not shifts because it's associated with increased risk for developing breast cancer. Now this study has shown what it does. What actually sleep deprivation and jet lag does to the expression of genes in your body, what and it, it actually disrupts. 30% of the genes that regulate your sleep, that regulate your function. I knew it. And it's, and, and it's <laughs> the first study to show that it not only does something to the physiology and endocrinology and the hormones, it actually affects your genes. And this is dangerous. Every time you start, forgive my French, to fuck with the genes, if yes, something, okay, something, bad, that one. So, yeah. <laughs> something bad happens. There so it's about a flight stewardess, and they have yeah. many health problems because yeah. of the jet Because of the patterns. Yeah. And then, don't and don't get me started on that. that. I tried to get Al Al to cooperate with me to and see if it's true. Their lawyer said, we're not interested. Yeah, my God, can you imagine how many lawsuits that opens yeah. the door on? Um, let's not go that way. But sleep patterns, not just jet lag, but uh, that, that would be shift, also. Shift work and. and waking up very wake early up in the morning. morning. Very early yeah. in the morning. Yeah. I'm just checking. OK, I'm checking. <laughs> For fresh mothers. So it's, yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. So this, this, it, it, it is actually a breakthrough because it can potentially provide us with a tool to combat that. So if we know which genes are altered, we can actually mimic the, the, the expression of the genes and bring them up back to or normal. Or pass a law that it's oh. illegal to wake up before 7. OK, <laughs> that would be me. I'm just saying. Um, OK, but the, the, this is the research that was done where? That was the, the, the That research was done out of Canada. Out of Canada, yeah. OK. That's so I, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a good journal that was published. It's a very respectable group of, of researchers. And most likely, you know, something as you said, I think every airline should actually sign up, and none of them will. 
well. Um, uh, Professor Friedman, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Neta Khitov, as thank always. You. This is it for us, folks. Don't forget to check us out on the web, I24 News, on Twitter or the Facebook. And by all means, don't forget to join us Monday morning for another edition of the Morning Edition to start your week, as you should be doing every single week. Thank you.